Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a regularly scheduled. Well, that's actually not regularly scheduled. It's a scheduled it's, meeting. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a scheduled meeting. The Southern Board of Selectmen on a new day because of the holiday and the amount of uh, stuff on our agenda that that needed to get done. Um, and hopefully, we'll be tying up pieces on a number of little things that we've been working on for a while. So I'd like to call the order at uh, 603. Uh, first order of business is we're going to speak with Mark Carter, who is the Vice President of Sales of Real Term Energy, and we're going to talk about LED street light conversion project. Mark. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, so I was asked to come here, and uh, uh, Real Term Energy, as, as a consultant, has gone through a fixture evaluation summary. And uh, today we have brought a couple of samples of the street lights uh, that we're, we're recommending. And it's a, it's a US based company, for Leo Tech, out of California. And I brought two different uh, size fixtures uh, to give you a, uh, a relative feel for what they would look like uh, on your town. Uh, the first one is. Uh, is uh, their what they call their Green Cobra Junior uh, version, and this is the type fixture that would typically replace your smaller wattages, uh, your 70 watt and 100 watt uh, fixtures, yeah. which I think would be the predominant uh, uh, fixtures that you have. Uh, everyone has a uh, seven pin receptacle. And what that allows you to do is, even if you don't opt for it now, in the future, if you wanted to add some sort of smart controls, okay, uh, it's ready to go. So everything is pre-wired from the fixture inside to the uh, driver. So if you wanted to dim it, it essentially uh, creates that voltage signal across there. And uh, this is all a, uh, a polycarbonate okay. uh, design. And it... Uh, so essentially the, the installation crews would be uh, replacing or removing the older HID lights and then uh, uh, from the pipe fitting here and then there's the landing of three, the uh, line neutral and ground wires uh, in there and then they would level it and then tighten the bolts um, and then affix the, uh, uh, fix the cover okay. and that would complete the installation of yeah, the- so uh, pretty quick. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty. It's all toolless, yep. uh, so it's easy for the uh, you know typically the uh, contractors can have gloves and such on, so they need to try to make it as easy as possible. So that's uh, the smaller version, and again, that would be probably the predominant one that would be used. Uh, there is the uh, mediums, which can go up to replacing uh, you know 150 watt, 250 watt lights. Uh, so there's different uh, models of that, as you can see, very similar design, only uh, a difference in scale and the number of actual LEDs uh, that drive that. But it, they're, it's uh, effectively the same uh, same construction on the inside where you have your power supply yeah. and then where all the, the wires are landed. So again, the, the, they'll uh, insert it on the mast arm, uh, the three wires, and then they level it, tighten up the bolts, and then... Uh, uh, close the cover. So it's a pretty straightforward operation in, in regards to the installation. Is it easy to replace the LED panel if something happens to that? Uh, typically, unlike HID fixtures where you have, you know, you could replace a ballast or a bulb, yeah. uh, typically because of the cost of these are being driven down into the $100, $120 range, it's typically much more expensive to try to you know, fix them on the pole than it is to take it off, replace it, okay. either work on them back at some central location. But they do have a full 10-year warranty, uh, so you would more than likely just RMA, just ship them back to the manufacturer and get one replaced at no new, cost. New head. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so once, uh, uh, once you make a selection on the fixture from a project standpoint, uh, because every light fixture has a different uh, uh, shape of light that it cast on the ground. Yep. Um, so based on the fixture, then we move to the photometric design. So we have our in-house photometric design team uh, that will actually look at uh, the light uh, based on the IES, based on the shape files of the, uh, of the particular fixture. 
And then once they're uh, completed with the photometric design, that's going to be fed into uh, what's called our investment grade audit. Uh, that'll include any and all uh, rebates if there are any, uh, all the photometric designs, all the final installation costs. So it is a, a bankable document if, if you were looking to, to do financing for that. Um, but it would be a point that uh, the council would have a chance to, to sign off and, and uh, uh, it would be essentially the final approval before going to procurement. So at that point, it triggers the, the uh, procurement of uh, installation um, uh, fixtures and uh, whatever are the miscellaneous items like the photocell uh, that would go on top of that for dust to dawn operation. Okay. Is there any um, like baffle or anything that goes around the light on the bottom or is that the entire fixture? Uh, th that is the entire fixture. So each individual LED diode yeah. uh, has its own uh, own covering. Okay. Uh, so it's 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 designed to be like this. It's not like there's not a flat glass that goes over yeah, uh, no. over that. Okay. And there are shield options as well. So in the case where you might need a, a house shield or a back shield, yeah, uh, there are different shielding the, options. Will limit the light, the spread of the beam. Uh, correct. But LED is much more focused. Right. Uh, so one of the things the photometric designers will do will look at the uh, light distribution type. So uh, typically you have type one to type five. Type one, you can think of a narrow alleyway, right? So you got, you don't want to push it very far, but you want to try to push it side to side. Type two is your probably most common uh, residential or road uh, way uh, distribution. Uh, you still get good side to side distribution, uh, but a little bit more across the road, depending on what your road class or road width is. And then you get into class three, four. So if you have a light at an intersection, you want it much more elliptical around to kind of push out into the whole intersection to, to light it for uh, the vehicles coming from all directions. So that's that's one of the things. Uh, so it'll look exactly the same. It'll it'll be labeled different at R2 versus R3 for okay. distribution type. Uh, but it does make a difference. And that's why the, the photometric designers will look at that for intersections. Uh, school zones, uh, things of that where they may have, have to have a little bit different light distribution. Okay, and we'll get an inventory of all that at the time for the, well, the yeah, location it's, it's sections and everything. Absolutely correct. So as part of the investment grade audit, we provide mm -hmm. all the design files, and then you, so you can look at any road, um, and you can look at the lights that were, were designed uh, for each one. And if there's questions, then we're happy to put our designers on there, and they can discuss why they picked a particular distribution for that, uh, okay. for that location. I wonder if we want to put that at some point into GIS as a layer or something, you know, with that information in there. That way somebody can sit at their desk and look at all the lights and know what, you know, what it, we've got out there. It will be in that GIS file. Okay. Uh, so in that Esri shape file, every fixture will have what the uh, recommended uh, fixture model numbers, uh, yep. distribution type, all that information will be part of that uh, part of that file. Okay, all right, good. And I think we provide that in multiple formats. If you have a GIS tool, it could be a shape file, or it could be a Excel or a access okay. database or something. So, so basically, what, ha what so everybody we can explain what happened is that uh, you put out a uh, a, re a proposal um, six six. Uh, um, items came back. Six people responded. Graybar, Fred Davis, Cree, Fred Davis with a Howard, Graybar with an Eaton, Graybar with Phillips, and Standard with a Leo Tech. And then, and then what? What Real Term actually did is they looked at the total price for the installation, replacing what we have now. They looked at the what it would cost for the 10-year operation operational costs of the units. They looked at the average lumen per watt per dollar. They were able to score that. They looked at the total fixture cost, which they scored the 10-year operation uh, cost, and they scored that. They looked at the photometric performance score, and they totaled it up. Um, and, and they came up with the highest score was the standard Leotech that was followed by the gray bar GE and then the uh, Fred Davis Howard. So so we actually have um, a competition for which which uh, um, fixture is going to be used. Uh, correct. So uh, the, the process for the evaluation is is there is a set of mandatory 
uh, right, which which would be disqualifying items to make sure they actually support the the ANSI the 136.41 seven pin receptacle to make sure they have a ten year warranty uh, to make sure that they have certain surge protection. So there are a list of minimum requirements to to, to make the consideration. And then at that point, uh, in regards to all the different columns, we do provide some weighting and some uh, uh, ability for, for the municipality to, to weigh in as well. And probably the one that wasn't the, the most straightforward is the photometric performance score, mm -hmm. is even if you're, you're emitting so much light, how much of that light is actually hitting the road. So depending on the shape of the uh, light distribution, because um, you know that, that's one thing that we, we do take into <clears throat> consideration. Uh, and as well, we, we do weigh not just the upfront cost, but also the 10 year operating cost, because sometimes that can be quite a bit more, uh, or it can be more than, than, uh, than what you're upfront. And especially since these have a 100,000 hour rated life, which is almost uh, about 23 years. Mm -hmm. So even if you consider 20 years, uh, your 20 year operating cost is more than likely going to be twice what your upfront costs are. So uh, sometimes it, it's, it pays to, you know, go with something a little more expensive if it saves you a lot more money over the long term. And and so so basically, there was a there was a competitive there was a competitive bid. Um, share um, Scott will be here a little bit later. We uh, he was kind of double booked on actually triple booked on a couple meetings tonight. So. He's going to be here a little bit later. Um, to, just so people realize is that uh, a lot of times we've been meeting every other week f throughout the summer. Um, we started doing it last year, and then around um, budget time, we went to every week. Um, what happens is that, believe it or not, um, there's many meetings that selectmen uh, attend. Um, and so the, typically the week that we're not meeting here, um, we have additional meetings to go to. So that way we can stay more up to date with, with things that are going on in, in the town because most of us serve on, on many different committees and boards. So that's, so today we did a Tuesday because we had a pretty heavily, a pretty heavy schedule coming off from a holiday. Um, so it was a, advantageous to move us on a Tuesday. Unfortunately, Scott had a uh, previous meeting that he really felt he needed to attend tonight. So that's, he, but he'll be here in a little bit. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Aaron? Hi, I'm a member of the Senate Land Energy Committee as a Scott Reed chair. When Paul Vessel made a presentation to our committee a couple months ago, he talked about the option of smart controls, which could also some additional money by uh, making lights uh, programmable and livable. Could you talk about that and how that would interface with the fixtures you have there? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, so smart controls, if, if you're familiar with what a standard dust to dawn photo cell is, is just a relay and a photo cell just opens and closes the relay to, to allow the, the, the power to flow through. Uh, a smart control typically integrates uh, a couple things, some some processing uh, if you wanted to score uh, or store uh, schedules, um, run time. So there's, there's typically some non-volatile memory inside of the controller. Uh, and it also has that uh, control output that would allow you to dim the fixture. So I mentioned before, uh, this if, if, I don't know how many people spend time looking at photo cell receptacles, but uh, on all the older ones, they don't have the four uh, gold-plated scratch plates. There's just the three power blades, and that's been around for 50 years. It's the 136.10 uh, uh, ANSI design. And all that really is is one neutral, and then you have your incoming power, and then your, your switch line going on into the fixture. So when you open the relay, it, it cuts power. Uh, when they came up with this new design, uh, these four lo uh, scratch plates are actually low voltage wires which are pre-wired inside of the fixture. And the two uh, that are reserved for dimming, uh, there's a gray and a purple wire inside, but you're essentially, when you give it a, a certain voltage, it will actually dim the light. So at 10 volts, it's full power, and at 8 volts, it's at 80% power, and 5 volts at 50% power, and so forth. So 
essentially when you either set a schedule or send a command to a smart control, uh, all it's doing is, is just generating a voltage on those pins, which go, which is pre-wired. Um, it's pre-wired to, <clears throat> and you can see there's a there's a purple and gray wire that's pre-wired to this uh, LED driver. <coughs> this is like a ballast or oh, something yeah. in the old days, but so, <laughs> exactly. So it's it's converting the AC to the DC to the to, to the lights, but. So that takes that signal and the driver says, okay, I'm getting five volts and it wants me to, to go to 50% power. So uh, the smart controls would allow you then to set a schedule that says, okay, um, maybe at 11 o'clock at night, you know, uh, activity buses are already dropped the kids off and maybe in residential areas, you don't, you don't want it as dark and you certainly have less pedestrian uh, potential for, for uh, vehicle pedestrian conflict because traffic typically dies down. Uh, so if you want to dim at a certain hour, so 11 o'clock, if you want to dim down to 50%, uh, you could do that. Um, uh, the other thing that a smart control uh, almost always has is some sort of RF or radio interface to communicate back. So in order for you from a central location to say, okay, I want these lights to turn on or a group of lights or to get <laughs> alerts, uh, there needs to be some sort of gateway that would communicate out to the lights. Um, and I haven't taken a look at the uh, the GIS file to see how your lights are distributed, um, but I will say, if you have less lights, there's less opportunity for them to act in a mesh. Uh, so in a mesh, uh, one the gateway will talk to a light, and then if the light's close enough to talk to the next light, it can kind of bounce the signal. Uh, yeah, but once you get kind of a if you get quarter mile gap, sometimes you lose that capability, and you have signal. Yeah, you lose the signal. There's no way for it to get back. Uh, there are some other longer range, uh, low power interfaces, like uh, lower is a very common uh, uh, radio frequency <coughs> in Europe that can go a couple miles. If mm -hmm. you can find a good tower gateway location that's somewhere high, you can get pretty good coverage. Uh, but that would probably be the most challenging thing is to get that all your your lights to communicate back or even a majority of the lights I mean you could you could have a mix you could have some that had dusted on photocells um, uh, or you could have others uh, but th there is an option there are some companies that make a device that maybe stand alone that can still do the dimming um, so you can set they have different pre-programmed schedules to come on at hundred percent at, at dusk and then at certain time frames at uh, 10 midnight and two I think, it, it can it can take drop the voltage, it can drop yeah. the voltage and then bring it right back up before uh, dawn as people start to get up and, and uh, for commuting purposes. Um, so that would be standalone. It wouldn't be radio interfaced and and if you wanted to change it, you know. So the pros and cons are yeah, you exactly you'd have to get up on the pole and 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 there's like a ten selector switch on on the bottom of it, but it has the two pins that drives that that zero ten volts for the dimming. So it just knows. Uh, based on uh, after three days of sunrise sunset, it knows when midnight is. It calculates that, and then it sets itself for for uh, moving forward. So there are some standalone options that you would have without having a, a full blown smart control system. What is your take on the economics of it? I mean, on the one hand, it's going to add to the cost to, to provide the smart controls. On the other hand, you're saving energy if you're dimming lights that are necessary. So how does that sort of balance out? At this point in time, there there are no economic savings uh, because the utility, if in this case you'll see the wattage is, is you know labeled on the on the bottom, 34 watts. Uh, the utility will bill you at 34 watts whether you're dimming 50, 60, 80, 10, none, mm -hmm. uh, because they say they have no way. And and even though there's meters, uh, electric meters in every controller, they aren't certified meters, and the utilities don't. Uh, now there are. I do see in the next few years that that could change. I know the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts is fighting to uh, have uh, the billing in the con their controllers uh, recognized. But so you would save energy, you'd reduce greenhouse gases. But from a ec pure economic standpoint, uh, it's there, 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 there is none. That's an interesting little topic there. But yeah, it just I think one thing that. <laughs> <laughs> you think the electric company wants to save your money? I know. Oh, no. <laughs> just like speaking of that, though, just for the, the television audience, 
one of those compared to an existing fixture now? Like, what's the wattage usage difference? Oh, it, so it, folks know. It's typically a 65 to 70 percent reduction uh, in the wattage. So a, a 34 watt would more than likely replace a 100 watt uh, uh, high pressure sodium light. Right. And even better than that is is uh, the uh, efficiencies of the LED power supplies are up in the you know the 0.99. Whereas uh, the, the old ballast are probably in the 80, 85%. So that 100 watt uh, HID fixture is probably consuming about 115 to 117 watts. Whereas a 34 watt may be consuming 35 watts total if you take in the total power consumption ballast, yeah. Yeah, of the ballast. Uh, and you don't have the, the heat generation, which is where some of your energy is, is, uh, is lost. In. And uh, it's certainly a, you know, a, a lighter, more manageable fixture to, uh, to, to mount and maintain. Yeah, that one's a cast aluminum right now. Is that what these ones are? This one is actually a uh, non-conducting oh. polycarbonate. Yeah, no, I mean the existing ones you're replacing. Are those are generally speaking. I haven't looked at, but it, uh, they're typically uh, stamped uh, or cast aluminum uh, uh, fixtures if they're like the old GE Cobra heads or something. So, okay, Aaron. Yes. Just when in when you have the photometric design. And you have the GIS. Are we able to zoom down to see the patterns of the light? Does it actually show you the shape of the of the projection? It it, it will on the on the photometric uh, designs that we do. Yes, we so we provide actually it shows um, uh, three different line colored lines which shows different light levels that are cut down in half. So depending on the road classification, if it's one lux uh, on the ground, and then uh, typically I think the inner one is black, and then blue is would be a half lux, and the red would be a, a quarter lux. So you can contours. You can actually see that exactly. So you can see how the design is, if there's any backlighting, uh, any any roughly uh, or, or potential chance of, of light trespass for uh, resins and things of that nature. So. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Scott had a question on the um, mounting. Oh, the is height. It, yeah, is the height, like between 22 and 25 feet. Is that uh, well, you you can mount it to any any height that you want. Uh, there's no limitation to that, but obviously the higher you get out, the the broader the distribution and the, the less light you're going to get to the ground. So when we first, the first step that we always do is a GIS audit, and we collect all that information. So we collect uh, 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 fixture height, we collect uh, road width, uh, setback, road classifications, uh, mast arm length. So okay. um, you know, if if you've got a pole with a with a four foot mast arm versus a ten foot mast arm, it's going to be farther over the road. So right. we're actually that's that's why we collect all that information. Uh, so up front. so <clears throat> before I think this is going to maybe sum up two questions. So before you go out to mountain, we'll be able to look at what the photometrics look like. Um, so tonight, we'll, tonight we're going to say go ahead and buy the uh, the standard from that that you've recommended that uh, um, real term is recommended. Then the next step is that you'll come back, you'll do your study, then you'll make a presentation to us or send us the information so that we can understand yep. what it's going to look like on on the ground. Yep. So 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 with the authorization, we're not actually going to procurement yet. Yep. But we would design based on the photometrics uh, of the lights. Of the lights. And then so that would be fed in. So the 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 deliverable would be investment grade audit, which would have all the detailed. Uh, uh, cost for, as far as the manufacturer or the, uh, the the fixtures, if what we recommend uh, as far as or estimate for rewiring, typically two percent for mast arms. You know, yep. you're going you're to find a couple that are up there that are cracked that you can't see from the ground. Right. Uh, so we try to build that in so you're not surprised from a cost perspective. Um, so that'll all be detailed rebates, installation, everything. So the investment grade and the investment grade audit will have a whole uh, uh, appendix on the photometric designs, which will include all the design files, as well as all the uh, GIS mapping, all the ESRI files uh, would be included into that document. So uh, and attachments. Okay. So we'll, we uh, we'll make sure that you guys will take a look at that also. Um, and if, if possible, if we had concerned with um, light washout into rooms or whatever in the residence, you also can put hoods on them. 
Yeah, yeah. So they have different shielding options to put on there. Perfect. And if you'd like, uh, you know, we typically deliver the uh, the photometric designs with the investment grade audit, uh, but we can send that ahead of time. So as soon as the, the designs are done, we could send those for you for your review. So we'll give you a little extra. Yeah. Excellent. That's yep. good. Be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you, David. Any questions? No, I think I got mine. Share answer. anything more? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, motion. Motion. Yeah, have a motion and I'll second that uh, we proceed with real. Therm's uh, recommendation of utilizing the standard Leotech fixtures. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Sherry, 2 0. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Next up, 6 30, we have an appointment with the bridge. Bridgeside Grill, we transfer a license from Bridgeside Partners LLC to 87 Grill DBA Bridgeside Grill, change of manager from Rose O'Hagan to John T. Riley. Correct? John? Okay. Okay. David, do you want to read the, uh, the legal notice? So uh, at this time, I will uh, <clears throat> like to open up our public hearing concerning the Bridgeside Grill. All right. Town of Sunderland, a notice of a public hearing. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 138, Section 12, the Board of Sunderland Board of Selectmen, acting as a local licensing authority, will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, October 9th, 2018, at 6.30 p.m. at 12 School Street, second floor conference room, Sunderland, Mass., on an application for a change of manager new office slash director, new stockholder, pledge of license and transfer of license for an all alcohol general on-premises liquor license, 87 Grill Inc. DBA Bridgeside Grill, located at 9 Amherst Road, Sunderland, Mass. The board will also consider other changes to license if applicable. Written comments will be accepted until the time of the hearing. All interested parties are asked to attend. Thomas D. Feidenkevitz, Chair, Board of Selectmen, Town of Sunderland. September 19th. Okay, so basically what, we're, what we'll be doing this evening is a transfer of all alcoholic beverage license from Rosa Hagen to John T. Riley. We will be approval of a change of manager from Rosa Hagen to John T. Riley. Approval of a change of officers, directors, the LLC managers. Also the approval of issuance and transfer of stock, new stockholder, and the Pledge of Collateral. And you are Esquire? I'm Brad Schimmel, uh, <laughs> and I'm representing Mr. Riley. Would you like us to come up front here? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Better for we the don't, We don't mind you guys sitting up front. Okay. <laughs> the the cameras can focus on you guys better. That's right. They get a yeah. good look at <laughs> Okay. So applicant and counsel, you get to speak in favor of this, why we should do this. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Riley is proposing uh, to essentially take over the Bridgeside Grill, uh, and he's not planning any major changes, uh, not, no remodeling to speak of. Uh, menu will largely remain the same. Uh, seating will re remain the same. Primarily about uh, 50 uh, people seated. There's a small bar area with about five seats yeah. currently. That would remain the same as well. Uh, probably with the change of the signage and maybe new personnel and seeing Mr. Riley, most people probably wouldn't notice a tremendous amount of difference after the, uh, the changeover. And uh, he is financing this through Greenfield Savings Bank, so he'll have a significant amount of his own, well, the bank's funds initially, but uh, he'll be on the line for it. So he's, he wants a successful business, uh, and uh, that's essentially his goal. Uh, he's uh, experienced in this line of work. He's trained. Uh, are you serve safe or tips? Uh, uh, serve safe. Serve safe. Yeah. Uh, he would require that of his employees as well. And uh, you know, to, he is very conscious of uh, 
the location, the proximity to the university, and obviously the need for uh, uh, being vigilant with regard to the service of minors. And uh, other than that, uh, as I say, it's fairly straightforward. He essentially is the whole shooting match uh, in terms of uh, president, treasurer, etc. 100% stockholder, and uh, would spend. Like you estimated, what, about 70 hours a yeah. week on site? So he's going to be... <laughs> but, uh, to be successful, the, the John, you only have to work a half a day, your choice. Okay. The yeah. night half or the day half. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, Would that, that be true, Rose? Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's the uh, that's the overview, really. Uh, if you have any specific questions, I'd be glad to answer, and uh, John can can respond to anything that I, I probably couldn't at this point. Okay. Well, before the questions, I'll ask: Are there any uh, anybody in the audience that'd like to uh, ask a question or comments? Yeah, you got a dead room tonight, John. That's good. Um, We've, uh, we've had, what, what we do as a matter of course, is we send out correspondence to all our department heads and our you know chief of police, fire chief, and any comments. And Sherry, we did that? We did that. And was there any uh, comments that we should know about? Uh, no, I believe you have all of the comments that came back. Yeah, we seem to come out pretty well, John. Okay. Um, any other, uh, nothing from outside? All right, um, David, questions? Uh, no, I don't think I have any specific questions. I think uh, we usually give you guys an opportunity to plug uh, the business, I guess, at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would just, I, I would just, look, look I, I mean, <clears throat> this board, um, we, we, don't, we don't want to be in the business of, of running a restaurant or a bar but we do have an oversight as uh, the the uh, the license licensing uh, grant tour. Um, we take very seriously um, serving to minors, um, and we participate whenever there's sting operations that we tell them put Sunland on the list that you're going to come in. Um, you you as a new owner, um, we start you start with you know a fresh slate. Um, but we have a we have a policy that we follow on on um, if if there is underage drinking, et cetera, and and we, we go through that policy with the suspensions of the license. Um, most we have very um, responsible operators, managers in town. The last time there was a stain we had, we, we did like three, four, or five of them had a problem. Uh, they all came in, um, accepted the uh, the consequences of their of their thing, and since that time we haven't had a had another problem. Um, so we we hope you don't need a a, a warning to start with. Okay, um, I believe and Rose, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I I believe that. You have an outside your your license right now includes serving on the outside patio. Mm -hmm. um, you know you, and again that you know you have to maintain. And I'm sure you recognize you have to maintain the separation. It has to have some type of roping or fencing so okay. people can't hand over things over the side. Um, and since forever. We've had some type of restaurant going back to the black black uh, kettle delicatessen, um, so it, it's been that type of thing. So um, we will give you after the close of the hearing, we will able we will give you an opportunity to uh, shamelessly plug your new endeavor so you can use it, so you can use it as an opportunity to introduce yourself to the to the community uh, knowing that you are following a a wonderful owner who has given a lot to that business but she's given a lot to our town 
um, and 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 we I, we can't speak enough. I can't speak personally. Can't speak enough about Rose and the silent partner Scott, um, who's usually there at four, five thirty um, a.m. But you're following very good, tremendous footsteps. Um, and we wish you we wish you the luck. We wish you the question Rose. Back um, I was just wanted to mention the fact that in this transfer of this license, the will it, will it be transferred the same as ours, like Sunday, where we have that stipulation where we can start serving at 10 a.m. as opposed to noon time because we close at two. Yep. Yeah, because okay. it goes with the license. Yeah. And 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 also, <clears throat> when it comes around New Year's, I know you're probably not thinking of that yet. But we will be sending out notices pretty soon. Can you can request that you stay open later on New Year's? Uh, I don't think Rose has done that, um, but that's uh, something that that, you're, that we do have the uh, opportunity to extend that license hours for New Year's if you want to stay later. Okay. Cause I know you're probably not going to be working enough hours. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but if you want to, if you want to serve New Year's, if you want to serve New Year's uh, meal or whatever. That that's also, but you would have to apply for that. Okay. Okay. Um, David, anything else? No, I think that's it. Um, I'm going to ask: Is there anyone that's opposed to the granting of this license as requested? Okay. I don't see any hands. Um, Sherry, anything more that we have to cover inside the hearing Just that I forgot? Just the uh, motion to close the hearing and then to approve. Yep. All right, so when we vote to close the hearing, we're not going to take any more testimony. Okay? Anybody have anything to say? Not hearing anything? No. Mr. David? Uh, motion to close the hearing. Okay, at this time, I will second that motion. All those in favor of closing this hearing, please... Uh, Signify by saying aye. Aye. Sherry, please note that the hearing closed at 642. Now we just dis we discuss anything. Anything more to discuss? I don't have any questions or anything. John, you have any questions to us? Um no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So at this time what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask for a motion to approve or disapprove, so David, that's your choice, mm. to transfer of all alcohol beverages restaurant license from Rose O'Hagan, manager, DBA, Bridgeside, to John T. Riley, manager, 87 Grill, Inc., the corporation's DBA, Bridgeside Grill. A lot of legalese, but this is what we have to do because we have a Esquire sitting here and this gets all sent to Boston. Approval of a change of manager from Rose O'Hagan to John T. Riley. Approval of a change of officers slash directors slash LLC managers. Approval of issuance, transfer of stock, new stockholder, pledge of collateral. Mr. Esquire, is that fine with that, you? That covers it, sir. John, is that okay with that? Yep. All right, I will accept a motion to approve or disapprove. Uh, motion to approve as noted. We have a motion to approve as presented. I will second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Two zero. The legal lease is done. You. John, you may shamelessly plug <laughs> your new business. Well, I want to do the same thing that Rose and, uh, and her husband has been doing. Uh, good upscale pub food with drinks. That's and, it? Yeah. Well, All right. <laughs> so Rose, had a few Rose, words. Rose came up here when she first did this, and she had a presentation and, you know, <laughs> and donuts, <laughs> like food samples. Yeah, or, food yeah. samples and everything. Um, no, we we, have a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we 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 appreciate. Um, yeah. You know, we wish you the luck. Um, you're right in the center of town. Um, I, I hope I hope your business uh, uh, thrives and multiplies and. And I, I really think, and I think Rose and Scott will tell you also that you get out of it what you put into it. And, and that's really the, the secret around here. But uh, John, very happy to welcome you to town. Hey, we look hey, forward hey, to seeing you. Hey. Hey.
All right, sir. we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. All right. Okay, next up, 645. Well, we are right on time tonight. Mark Cappadona uh, from Colonial Power. Um, our next uh, our next step in aggregation. Come on forward, Mark, if you would. Good evening, uh, Mark Capitona, Colonial Power, Five Mount Royal Ave, Marlboro, Mass. So, I, from talking with Sherry, I, I think we wanted to get kind of clear the air about kind of where we are and how we got to where we are. So, yep. Colonial was um, participated in an RFP from the FERCOG for an opt-out aggregation. That's what they put out there for Colonial to do. That's what we do as a, uh, as a business. We, we create, manage, from soup to nuts, we take care of everything required in an aggregation, basically. So when we responded, we, we were the winning um, bidder, and that's why we came to you with an opt-out aggregation. But there's been some, I think there's been some uh, miscommunication. So why exactly an opt-out aggregation? So the law that we're actually utilizing here is 164-134. And that's a municipal aggregation. It's an opt-out municipal aggregation. To do an opt-in aggregation, you don't need to do any of this. And the reason you don't have to do this is people are using a choice. All of this is for education so that everyone gets educated along the way. So there's the hanging of the plan. There's a vote of the, city, uh, of the Board of Selectmen. After that, you go to the DOER. There's a public hearing by the DPU. It requires everyone to get a mailing, all sorts of um, information on the websites, newspaper articles, those kind of things, PSAs, so that everyone has the ability to make a decision. The unfortunate thing about the, uh, the current legislature is it's an opt-out, and the reason for that is the energy world and how that works. So I don't think I had the chance to explain this in, in the past. Mm -hmm. So when we run an aggregation, we expect kind of across the state, we, we, we have about 80 of them that we do, and we expect somewhere between 97 and 93% of the people to stay in the program. We have all of that data so that we can get a very good price, an accurate price on your load. It shows what your, all your, and I don't wanna get into the weeds too much, but your, your installed capacity tags are, as well as what your annual usage is. All of that helps them create a, a price that doesn't have much margin in it. That's why aggregation has worked across the state. Opt-in aggregations, if I went to a supplier and I said, I'd like to run an opt-in aggregation, could you give me a price? They're gonna say, well, how many people? Well, I'm not sure. And then once you get the people, then you have to get their bills and you have to get all, all of that information. That's why they have found that most opt-in aggregations haven't worked. Point of fact, the, um, the attorney general had run a report that said, in 2015, 2016, these are opt-in aggregations that individual suppliers call our house and send us mailings, mm -hmm. have cost the residential marketplace $175 million, over and above what they would have paid on basic service. Yet with aggregations, that's not the case because you, you get to make some decisions that you would like. Things that the utilities can't do, longer, greener, any of those things local, the utilities don't have the ability to do that and that's what choice was all about, the Deregulation Act of 1997. Basically, in a nutshell, that's why Colonial is in front of you with an opt-out aggregation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So next steps would simply be, the plan has been hung, you approve that plan. After the plan is approved by this body, there would be a, a simple phone call with maybe 12 other towns that will have the DOER. Call lasts normally about 15 or 20 minutes. After that call, uh, Denise will pull together a complete filing that will go into the Department of Public Utilities. At that time, they'll hold a public hearing. About 30 days from that, there'll be a public hearing. Colonial will put in the, the local paper, they want it in the Globe or the Herald, a, 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 a legal notice about the DPU hearing, and we'll put one in the local paper here. If anyone, unfortunately, they're conveniently located in downtown Boston, um, at the Department of Public Utilities uh, offices. 
Colonial will be there on your behalf. No reason that anyone here needs to show, but the public is always welcome to show and, and give public comment. Most times we don't have any, given the distance and the length of time, the public hearing lasts about less than five minutes. After that, there'll be some questions back and forth. They call them interrogatories. They're simply questions on the plan. Colonial will answer them for you. You'll get an order out at some, some point in the future. I couldn't tell you when. Probably a little more elongated than we'd like, given the current gas problems in Merrimack Valley and, and Woburn at this time. So we expect things to take a little bit longer because there's some safety issues with the gas um, uh, here in the state. So we do expect that to elongate things. Some, I wouldn't say a long time, but certainly longer than than's currently going on. Um, after that, we have some discussions about what it is the town is looking for for a product. They want to do something long, two, three years. Do they want to do something greener? Do they want to have two products, an opt-in green product and a, a standard uh, basic product? All of those decisions can be made down the line. The reason we just don't make them right now is the process is still long. Meaning we're probably, we're hoping that next July that we would have something ready that we could get out to market when your summer rates came out. That's basically what I'm here to, you know, unless there are other questions, I'm happy to engage anyone in any questions. Okay, Sherry, one, one of the uh, things when we, when it was posted, we, uh, we asked if there was any, um, the plan was posted, um, on Wednesday, September 12th at 9 a.m. and it hung until October 2nd, 2018 at 5 p.m. And anybody that had any desires to comment, they could do so in person at the town, clerk off, town clerk's office or submit written comments using, you know, we have a couple uh, uh, methods. Did we receive any comments? We received a couple comments that were forwarded on to Colonial Power. And those comments will be included in the filing in totality. There won't be any changes to those comments. Those comments will be heard by the Department of Public Utilities as okay. is. All right, so right now um, I'll ask if there are any comments here. Questions. Okay. Two. Hey, Mark. Hey, Will, how are you? I'm fine. Excellent. <laughs> um, when, when you talk about the opt-in process not having worked, has any municipality participated as a municipality with an aggregator as an opt-in process in Massachusetts? Or have they all been, I'm going to call them co-opt process? Um, co-op slash opt I would, yeah. So right. the answer is- I know, I know. Yep, 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 yep exactly. Yeah. So I would say, no, there has been no opt-in attempt at this time. Okay. Because I mean, the opt-in programs that are out there are basically they are individual ones where you as an individual, you know, you can go to the Eversource site, they'll say these are the other ones, Correct. you know, and you can sign up for those, and those are the ones that the AG office has said cost a lot of consumers more money. Um, and I can see why, because, I mean, I'm looking at the Eversource, uh, uh, you know, rates, and right now the rate that they have is probably as low as it was 2005 or whatever. Correct. Um, but I'm thinking that if you had a municipal opt-in program working with a company like you and the consumer in town sees that, the, that, that basically there's an endorsement by their elected officials that this is a good plan and I'm wondering what the level of participation would be in something like that. And I don't know if it's been done in other states. I would love to see it attempted. Um, you know, I'm going to guess that you would get way more than 5 or 10%. And like I, you know, I said, I mean, at our town meeting, we had 80 people vote for it. They had, could have signed up right there. So I'm just, that's, I'm, I would like to, I would, I would like to see a pilot done. I would like to see somebody attempt it. Um, if it's never been done before in Massachusetts. And in all honesty, it wouldn't require any process yeah. because it was opt in. Right. But again, I don't know how you would reach out to the customer, to the consumer base that you're looking for. You'd know better than I in that scenario. And this is the best mousetrap that they've created so far right. to, to capture as many people and bring them as much choice as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's driven by, at, at the local level for the local people. And it's not perfect by any means, yeah. but it is the best mousetrap they've found 
even more effective, and I'm just going to say, I've been contacted by communities outside Massachusetts to ask, and I, I've asked them, you know, what kind of interest do they have, and they said, that's a difficult thing to test without spending money on a mailing and then getting back. I can only tell you that on most mass mailings, I'm not saying this because this is coming from the town, right. you normally get somewhere between three and 5% participation. So if you sent out uh, 100 uh, pieces of mail, you'd expect to get three to five people opting into that um, situation. That may not be the case when the city is involved, the municipality is involved, yeah. but I can only talk about from, from a commercial standpoint, that, those are the kind of numbers that we would be seeing from a Constellation, a Con Ed, people like that. How many, how many uh, rate payers do we have in Sunderland? I mean, I got a ballpark idea how many households there are. I can pull it up, it's just going to give me 10 minutes. It's like a 1,000 like maybe, uh, residential rate payers. That's a little over. I, I think it is. I think, I think to be well. If you get around it, yeah. I think there's like 800 and something okay. uh, 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 meters that are going to be now. Some of those meters may already have moved to other competitive supplies. They wouldn't be. They could always join the program, but they wouldn't be mailed to originally because they'd already made a choice. Yeah, That's yeah. correct. So yeah, got, if you got if you got like uh, a 20 percent participation rate uh, for the first year, would that be worth your while? Uh, so I'm going to tell you, I, I have aggregations in very small towns. Uh, 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 one of the smallest towns in Mass, um, New Ashford, and there's about um, 80 meters. And we have, we have people bid on the low. Yeah. So it, it's, it's truly just, now some of the larger companies won't bid on that, but there are some small companies that will bid that load. So you, you don't get the full participation, Right. But sometimes you get lower cost because you're not dealing with Constellation Direct Energy, those right. big boys. Right. Okay. I, can only, I can only tell you from that standpoint, yes, right. they, they have bid on things of, of that size. Yeah. Okay. I guess my question is, do we have access to the load data from the utility to show the supplier or no? You're just going in with a certain number of of meters because right now we have access or the town has access to the load data to go out to RFP to get the suppliers to bid because we have a DPU order. Yes. Right? Well, if you're just individuals, you, like, like you're saying, what are you going to bring to them to show them what the load is that they're bidding on? Well, unfortunately, we would bring them the account numbers because we'd have the okay. They would have to go to the utility and request the Request data. and pull out, which is, yeah. It's a different model, but yeah, I'm saying it could be of, done. Yes. I'm going to slow things down quite a bit. Yeah, well, the problem is, is you're not going to get, you're not going to get the laser um, thin margin that you're going to get when, so this has been, they bid on load all the time in this way, so they're very comfortable knowing what, what kind of churn is going to happen, what kind of migration, so forth and so on. That allows them to price the load that much better. It's why we're able to compete and actually do things that are different, meaning you can do a two or three year rate, you can't get that rate. You can, on an individual, don't get me wrong, as you said, you go to the DPU, there's a website of 50 different uh, options. But you, you can't get it bid the way that we're looking to bid things. That's kind of the difference. The aggregation model literally spins the, the bidding process on the supplier. So currently, what we would do is, we get their terms and conditions to serve us. And that would be the same thing with an opt-in. What we say to the, the marketplace is, these are our terms and conditions. If you want to serve our load, you have to have an, an automatic opt out, opt back in, so forth and so on. You know, you're going to bid these terms. We tell them what the, uh, the rules and regulations are. Not, if I was doing an opt in, they'll say, yeah, we'll do it, but it's going to require a $25 opt out and they're going to require this and that. Just the opposite exists with Immuniac. If you want to serve us, these are, our, these, are our, uh, uh, these are the conditions under which you need to uh, perform. Actually, that's one of my questions too. Is is that there's a charge for somebody to opt out? Never a charge to get in or out. So okay. somebody wanted to get out six months before the program started. Oh, they think the electricity is going to go out. Doesn't have anything to do with this, but they believe that. Yep. Six months later or three months later, like oh, I should have stayed in. Get back in, no fee or penalty, and get back out if they wanted to three months later. Because I think that's one of the one of the issues with the current market is costs for people to opt in and out. And I would say that if we could warn people, if you're going to do it, electricity is going to be expensive this weekend, I mean, not this weekend, this winter, please make sure you check the small print on anything you're going to sign in up for, because there are going to be big penalties in that small print. 
positive of that have been the last three winters. So just be careful of anything you sign. If you check the small print and you're comfortable with it, there are some companies that don't have that small print. There are other ones that do, though. It's a great point. So, um, Mark, if, if you, so let's say the town puts out a, uh, uh, a call for interest yes. in, in participating in the program, and they got two or three hundred people that said, yeah, yeah, this sounds great. This, you know, uh, it's like order for it. Uh, they like the contractor. Uh, it's, a, it's a free opt-in process. It's a free opt-out process, all that. And you end up with, like I said, two or three hundred people. You can't go to, when you, when you go and look for a contract, you can't say it's still free opt-out as it was as, as if you went through a an opt-out process. We can say it, yeah. but more likely than not, they're going to push back because it's more work on their side. So we're going to require that each person... Why would it be more work on their side if you have two or three hundred customers who want to be part of the program? Because the way the opt-out works is the Department of Public Utilities issues an order that requires the Department of Public... Excuse me, that requires the uh, distribution company to deliver us the load data from all the customers. So if you're on basic service, we will get your okay. information. So I guess so, so if you have a specific number of people who've signed up, it's uh, then it becomes that you have to get their data and not everybody else's data. They can't do it like on an average. Or That's something. good. They won't do it on an or okay. they'll do it, but they won't price it well. Okay. Because of the risk of what is all of those unknowns. Okay. Have I bought too much? Have I not bought enough? So, you know, do I have to go to the spot? It all depends on, that's why that load profile, the data we receive from the utility, and we get all of it, is so paramount. And then they, they know what averages are across the state. We've been running them for well over 12 years, so they know what those things are, and they can bid them very competitively. The, the other thing doesn't just require everyone to say, yeah, I'd like to see that. It requires you to give a list, and then that list has to be given to three different suppliers that are Get it, given the okay, you know, we need a little signature thing that says, yep, they're okay to pull your data. Mm -hmm. And then that data needs to be pulled and then compiled. And then we, you know, then we need to know that you're going to, they're hoping, this will be the first one that everyone stays. That's the, the whole, they, they now know for the most part, like I said, somewhere between 93 and 97% of those people will stay in mm -hmm. uh, the program, for the most part. And with aggregations, we do quarterly um, mailings to those who are on basic service still, so they know that the, the volumes are going to stay up because anyone who moves into town or comes off a competitive supply contract, say every three or four months you mail, you enroll those people, you know, you're constantly... So someone moved out of an apartment or you right. sold a house, the next person moves in, you have the right to sweep those people in. You've got to give them the right to opt out before the program starts, but it's the whole mechanism set, set up where now you'd be re-knocking on doors, if, if someone left, I'm saying you moved or someone in an apartment moved out and they left the aggregation. That's one of those things that would end up hurting you is trying to continually bring new customers in to keep the load consistent. Mm -hmm. So there, there are, as I said, there are certain uh, advantages MuniAg has and that's why you find the pricing to be that much tighter than you've seen on other opt-in products. Not that it couldn't be done, it's just I don't think that the mechanism currently exists to allow that shop pricing that we currently have, the advantages we have in the marketplace. It sounds like the stumbling block is getting that, that data that they require. Yeah, to price it correctly. Right. Well, it's not stumbling, it's just cumbersome, right? So you've got to get 300 people's forms, then you've got to get them the spreadsheet, then they've got to, they got to send over a file to uh, the utility, the utility sends them back the data, mm -hmm. then they've got to check and make sure that all the signatures are there, where aggregation doesn't require that. If you, you know what I'm saying? They have to make yeah, sure that it's all yeah, yeah, verified. I get it, I get it. Yeah. So Mark, Mark, would you say on the whole you could save the rate payers uh, money? Uh, certainly uh, one against the other, yes. There's no question that the goal of the program is to save money. That's the goal. It doesn't always happen. Some people are looking to do things that are green and longer term and depending on what happens with the basic service rate, you might be over. But for the most part, the goal is to save people and stabilize rates. That's the goal of the program. So when, when Sherry, when you bid out, when you, when you go buy our electricity, what, what's the criteria that, you're, that you have to state for? Uh, we go out with the um, 
El, the lower Pioneer Valley. Yeah. And uh, they they do that bid on behalf of several towns that belong, and there is a criteria, um, and we receive several proposals. The low this year was public power. In past, we've had constellation. Um, there's different terms. The you know the longer we go out, the the lower the rates. So all of those things matter. So we usually typically pay less than because we're joined oh, absolutely. with. Absolutely. Your, and your Another low town. profile is beneficial compared to a residential user. Just so you know, like the low profile of the buildings matches up well with what people are looking for. People, I mean suppliers. Normally municipals do very well, they pay. And there's certain, I don't know if you have a water treatment plant, it's a, it is a perfect load profile. Comes up and runs 24 seven. Runs 24 seven. That means on a power plant, Bring it up, run it, set it, forget it. You and I use our electricity in the morning and then again at night. We're residents, right? Go to work, there you come go. back, yeah. That means you gotta turn it on, you gotta bring power on, they gotta take it down, they gotta bring it back on later on. It's more expensive. Will? Uh, <laughs> I, I, are you looking for a sort of like a, a response now? Uh, well, I, I know, I mean, you're basically have the the most questions right now. I want right. to make sure I'm, I, I'm, I'm not. Mark and I had a conversation on the phone, kind of about this, and um, and we pretty much both realized that we're not going to. I know. Change each other's mind. But but, but, to me, I, but think, I, I think I think it's important for you to be able to get yeah. to express your point. So what I like about what I like about where we are now is that you 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 know you do have an opt-in option as a board. It's not just nothing or co-op slash opt-out. You have an opt-in option. It's much more difficult for Mark to use that as a business model and um, and no, you won't effectuate the same kind of savings as you could as if you um, you know co-opt everybody into it and you get the, the five percent drop out rate. Okay? So there's the, there's the trade-off is is it worth the I don't know how many you know tenths of a cent on a kilowatt hour or hundreds of a cent on a kilowatt hour I'm not sure you know what the savings are I wouldn't yeah <laughs> is is it is that so valuable as to change the way the town government interacts with the private citizens and we get back to that idea of um, you know, the bills come in my name, they get paid out of my account. No matter how much education you do, you're still going to have a process where you are co opting people in. You assume you have their consent, but you don't really know. And uh, I don't, I, you know, again, I don't think that's the right role for a municipal government to have. I realize it's being done all over the place. It changes my relationship with the town government. I may be one of a handful of people in town, but I think it's important. Sure. And so it's a question of trading off mm -hmm. the money versus what I would call uh, the discipline of government and keeping it in its proper role. Um, you had people come in and say they wanted you to do this, and that's great, but I don't think it's right, again, for having other people, you know, uh, affecting my accounts at, in my home without my permission. So I, I, I prefer an opt-in process. I understand the obstacle that it creates for Mark. I'd like to think that there's enough interest in town that you would get a lot of people, that you, you would get enough to the equivalent of a small town, you might get more. I don't really understand how how much of uh, an impact that would have on the savings or the amount of work that he would have to do or whether he would need to charge a higher rate as a, uh, as a consultant or I can't remember the term that you use. I'm a consultant. Okay, so that's the trade-off. Um, and that's the, that's the decision you guys have to make. I've said my piece. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Mr. Bergeron, you probably know what we're talking about, huh? Yeah. So have you had any any experience with opt-in language? Opt into the the ability to opt into a, a product? Yeah. Yes, but not opt. It, so I, I, we're just a little late to this party, and so uh, Will's discomfort is with the opt-in nature of it, uh, the opt-out nature of it. Yeah. He calls it co-op. Yeah. Um, the way the law is written, it's to benefit the energy user, and there's a bunch of benefits that come with that. Sure. And at least at the beginning, the only thing I will say is everyone has a choice. I don't disagree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets a mailing. Before the program starts 30 days, they can opt out. So that's their choice. They don't want to be in the program. Before every single meter gets a mailing. I don't disagree with the statement. I'm not certain everyone reads their mail today. So I don't know if most of the people would see that or not. We wouldn't start a program unless we were below basic service. But to his point, the, the, the issue isn't so much with the program as it is with the function of the opt-out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the reason I'm saying that, that opt-out is what makes this program mm -hmm. so efficient and so effective. So back to my question. Have you exercised as an aggregator an opt-out? Never been done in never been done. never been done in mass. That I'm aware of. I, I, I've been doing this for 15 years. Never heard of anyone. Plenty of opt-ins, but not a municipal. What Will's talking about is it's going to be municipally Stand. run. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna, the, the town is going to say, we're going to run this. this there's lots of opt-in aggregations out there. But believe it or not, the town is participating we're, we're in an opt-in. Yeah, yeah right. down to, that's yeah. an opt-in aggregation that you guys are running effectively right. because of the, the different load. Right. It, it has not been found to work in the marketplace with the residential user. Okay. So the volatility of that's the correct. consumption. Any more questions? Uh, no. Any more? No, no, no more questions. I think, I think for just like you were saying earlier, I think our goal is to save money with this. I mean, that's essentially what we're trying to do is save money for the ratepayers. That that's the the backbone of aggregation. That's right. the and, and then there are other things. Don't get me wrong. Meaning, there's lots of people that use this for local green renewables and long-term stable rates and things of that nature. But I think everyone's major goal is to try to bring down the cost of electricity. Well, I, have, I do have one, one question, actually. Over the longer term, what if, how, how would it be affected if we get, I don't know what the percentage of people with, say, solar is right now, but say that spikes to, you know, over 50% of the town over, say, a 10-year period. How does that affect the program? N not at all. That's a financial transaction between you and the distribution company. Mm -hmm. So you still use all the kilowatt. I need to take one half step back. Okay. If you Just physically sure own like that, that, uh, that um, the solar, the solar array, resource, yeah. th that's a different animal altogether because right. now you're actually net metering yourself. Right. Right. Everyone else gets a net metering credit. They still use the same amount of kilowatts. There's a credit put on. Now there'll be a thing called, a, it's called a, um, an AOCH, as an AOBC. It's, an, it's going to be an alternative on-bill credit mm -hmm. rather than a net metering credit. That's the new smart program the regs would just put out there. It's going to work similar, eerily similar to what was going on in SREC 2. Mm -hmm. So you'll still, if you use 1,000 kilowatts, you'll still get the credit up, uh, up above, and then they'll give you some kind of credit, meaning, okay, I'm going to get, they'll, they'll, I'm just going to say, they're going to credit your bill 100%, you're going to have to send the solar developer 85% or 90% of whatever that bill is. That's the way it currently works in the, in the marketplace. So can I follow up? I know I was late. I was at another meeting. I look at the sentence preceding, right? And it says, once a contract's been, I'm on page two. Once a contract's been negotiated by the town's consultant. Yes. It must be submitted to the Board of Selectmen for approval. And lastly, eligible consumers may opt out of the program and select basic service. That's the, the way it reads. Yes. Is there a tension between going to the marketplace and having this an opt-in program? There's nothing in the statute that says it can't be at this level. You, you don't need to do any of this. I'm, I'm sorry, you weren't here earlier. You don't have to do any of this process to do an opt-in. Mm -hmm. This process is to effectuate an opt-out. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. So what's an opt-in process look like? It would be the town sending out a mailing to its residents and asking them if they wanted to opt-in. And then you just simply need a couple of uh, data points. We want to get a copy of the bill mm -hmm. and some format with the sign-off. It requires a wet signature sure. that everyone signs off and says yes. 
and then we need to get that compiled and delivered to suppliers that were willing to serve that load. Nice. In anything you're interested in doing? Not me, no. Okay. I had to ask. Yeah, well, I, I understand. Thank you. You sure. We kind of, yeah. Any other comments? Aaron? It doesn't seem to me that this is such a radical departure for the select board to make. I mean, my, if memory serves, a few years ago, we had a municipal trust traffic collection for recycling in town. And the town went out to bid to sure. identify a trash collector and hauler for everyone. Now, everyone has to find their own hauler and pay their own bill and probably pay more money than we did when it was through the taxes. So it's not as if there's no precedent for this type of arrangement to, to happen in summer. That the select board decides on um, what the best arrangement is using the economics and the bidding process, which Mark helps us with, and decides uh, what the best situation would be. We don't necessarily get consent from every person who generates trash to do that, but it seemed to me that most people were, were fine with that. I will say it's That's an analogy I haven't heard before, but it's, well, well, it's used okay. many times. But if I don't know if you have a cable company in town, you've done the same thing with the cable company. Well, it will approach you. Yeah, and, we shouldn't even. We should not even go there. Yeah, yeah, you, don't you, even, you shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. same yeah. process. You, you, should, you, should, you shouldn't say that because it's it the, didn't only, go the only meetings I've been to where my wife has said, "Where have you been?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 their original thing we'd be here to 11 11 yeah, 30 at night during those and i hope that's a whole other ball not of get life. anything near <laughs> that again yeah there won't be any issues i'll say to you with this program <laughs> there really will not there there shouldn't be any municipal time taken up other than decision making right i i i would i would just address aaron um Will's point about uh, government and their reach into the inter interface between private and local or government municipal is is a is a concern to me. It always it always has been. Um, and look, we have. Uh, so in, in my opinion, a selectman, a selectman is responsible for a, a very few things. We're responsible for public safety. We're responsible for condition of the roads. We're we're responsible for education, um, and and that those are the and, and I was told that 20 years ago by Walter Strozik, and I, those those things still still ring solid to me. I and. And when we when we put other things into that, it be, it, it does become, to me, blurred. I I understand what Will says 100 percent. To counter that, I would say that we have a form of government um, through the annual town meeting that that dictates what we do, and and as a selectman, I also take a an oath. That I will follow the direction that the town votes. Um, Lauren Starr sits in the back room, and she knows that I was not 100% in favor of the uh, the library. But once the library was voted on by a town meeting, this, you know, m my job was to ensure I did everything that I could to make sure that library got built because that was the wishes of of the town. And I think we did pretty good, Lauren. You know, we had. And and but that that's a job of a selectman, and I I guess that's I have it. And Will, I I know exactly what you're saying. I'm and my my heart is beating with yours on this on this issue. But when we went to town meeting, we took a vote that in our town, and everybody, every registered voter had an opportunity to vote, and those that were interested in it came out and voted. I can justify it in my mind by that, and plus I think I understand the whole thing about aggregation because I know I've said many times so, to uh, Margaret before Sherry, man, I wish our, our rate payers and Sunland could pay what we pay as a municipal side for, for 
power because I look at right. I look at the cost and and they are so much less than what I would what I pay as a homeowner and and it's like and I see this as an opportunity for us to work together to get better prices so that being said Scott or David you have anything else to say uh, I appreciate that we can have this discussion of differing opinions um, unlike some places in the country without like yelling and all sorts of other uh, <laughs> things so I think and and I appreciate the thought that uh, that's put into it by uh, I don't I think I don't know there's one other I, I'm gonna assume you were one of the comments right well actually I didn't see or, anything in writing but I, oh, okay. I think I've communicated by email I'm not mm -hmm. sure yeah I saw the emails yeah but I mean, I appreciate the thought that goes into that too. I mean, and, and I, I will, it's, it's important. And I will say, and I think Mr. Bergeron, he got to it when he uh, read on page two. Yeah. This isn't the end. The only thing we're, we're saying right now is that we're going to go to where we want to make our proposal. That we're going to get. A, we're going to get a that, proposal that go right. that goes well. We, we have our right. Plan, plan the plan that right. gets that gets submitted for the to the DPU for them to hold a hearing on, and then we still have a lot of work to do, and we still at the end of it we may say no. Right, and I'm just going to tell you the important. truth. We have clients three years given some capacity issues that haven't moved forward with their plan, and the reason is pricing is an advantageous product that they were looking for. They just haven't moved forward. Sure. They have the ability to at their leisure, but currently they haven't moved. Yeah, recheck the price, see what it's like. That's exactly right. correct, and that's. Since it's one of the primary drivers, I get that. You know. So, anything else? Anybody want to add anything else? Okay. So, uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion to uh, submit this plan for a review by the DPU for their uh, public hearing. Yeah, we want to just approve the plan as yeah, as plan. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's uh, the that's the term we want in the notes yeah. or the minutes. I'll make a motion. So we have a motion to approve the plan. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion to approve the plans made and seconded. Any further discussion? And hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 2 1. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. You also. Next up, Mr. Wisman, front and center, sir. Do we have police? How are you, David? Just police. Just police. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Sherry, what do we have with Mr. Uh, Dave? Uh, you have a request for a one-day liquor license for October 19th for a beer tasting at Mike's Maze. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah. Doing it again. That's good. The insurance certificates are attached to the application. Uh, the police chief has weighed in. And David is here to answer any questions you have about the event or the request. David, you want to tell us what you're going to be doing? Yes. Um, it's going to be similar to what we ended up doing last year, which I know some of you attended. Um, we are inviting six um, breweries to the maze. They will set up stations out in the maze. Um, and basically, the goal is people will come and try to find the different, find their beer out in the maze. Um, After drinking the beer? <laughs> no, no, you have to, you drink, you, when you, you, you have go to in the maze it. first, then yeah. you come out. It's yeah. the reward right. of oh, the maze. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So at each we may have to bring the fire department out to do a, a recovery. <laughs> uh, that's what I was wondering. Did you, sure everyone made it out. I was going to oh, ask no. if you found anybody in the morning in the no, corn. In the morning, and got, no, everyone go. made it out just fine. I think everyone made it out by illicit means through the sign. Everyone made it out at the end of the night. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was it was such a success and people had so much fun. We're, we're actually doing it three times in total this year. However, this I'm here just for the one day on the 19th. I'm still collecting some of the insurance paperwork for the other two days. So I'll be back at the next meeting. Okay. David, Scott, questions? Will uh, When you come back, uh, Dave, will that be with both dates? Yeah, I'm gonna just try and get both dates. So this this is this is the the first one, and then we're gonna come back and clean up the rest, and we'll get recommendations. Again, we have we have a checklist ourselves, and I see the insurance on here. It's important we get the feedback from public safety, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Great. And, and also, if 
Did, did we have anything to add? No, no. Um, I, I also would like just to uh, um, get it out there early enough so that um, residents or neighbors have an opportunity yeah. to comment right. before that also. Right. Right. And, I, and I know you work with them, but, you know, I'm, right, we, we, like, we like their input. I guess we just like their input as well. So as soon as you can get notice that we can get it published so okay. that uh, we get that out there. If that's yeah, okay. no, I, I, I have been practically contacting people, so I'm, yeah. I'm hoping I will be able to get that all to you. I'm hoping next week. Very early good. next week. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. Um, um, question? No. We can move to move to approve the one-day permit uh, submitted for uh, Mike's Maze. Ten nineteen six through nine p.m. Second. Okay. A motion made and seconded to approve a one-day liquor license for Mike's Maze um, for October nineteenth between 6A and 9P. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye, aye. David, good luck. Thank you very much. Three zero. Okay, we got a two seconds of 730. We got um, North Main Street. So we, we uh, approve of the minutes of 920, 924. Uh, make a motion on those. I have a motion made. Um, hang on, I just read them. Second. A motion made and seconded to accept as presented the minute from 924. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Three zero on that, Sherry. Um, the uh, wastewater treatment plant gearbox award, Sherry. have in here a recommendation from Rich Brenda for the award for the gearbox um, to Universal Electromechanical Services and the amount of that is $11,988 and the funds are available they were budgeted for. Okay, Scott. David? No, Mr. Chair, this came back to Rich after there was some question about rigging and how deep we're going to go into whether it was just going to be exposed and then repair upon examination. It seemed more thorough this time around. So hmm. I'll take the uh, recommendation of uh, Rich, uh, Rich Brendan, treatment plan operator, engineer, and uh, award this accordingly. Can, can I? Do you second? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, Sherry, could, could you? Um, as part of the process, could you ask Rich to ensure that we have, or he has, a copy of all the bearings and seals okay. um, mm. and the parts yep. that are utilized so next time we go out we can get a competitive bid right. even really before good. we send it out. Mm -hmm. I know because like on that, on that bottom, mm -hmm. that bottom bearing, pedestal bearing, that alone is over, you know, probably over a thousand dollars right mm -hmm. now on that bearing. So. It'd be nice to have, if we could have pricing, you know, or identification of all those bearings so that we can get the uh, pricing course sent out next time. And that can be a deduct alternate as opposed to a surprise. Mm. Absolutely. Right. Not. Hey, well, and don't get me wrong, I don't think the 11000 price is bad. No, no, I understand. But if you yeah. get in there and it's another blank for something that was something you couldn't determine. T typically, typically, um, most of those gearboxes don't include the uh, the pedestal, yeah. that, that, that pedestal bearing. Yeah. Um, so that that's usually always an adder. So mm -hmm. that if you don't know about it and you accept somebody's bid, right. you're going to see a twelve, fifteen thousand dollar adder right. on that. So, okay. all right. So we have a motion made to accept the uh, recommendation from uh, Warners to utilize Universal Electromechanical to rebe rebuild gearbox number two at the WWTP. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, it is now 727. Um, Proclamation Fire Department. You have that from Rich. He was gonna, uh, from Steve. He was going to do a condensed version, but I didn't. I didn't receive that. So you have the long version. So there's a lot of where. There's a lot of where as. But it is um, Fire Protection Week. <laughs> 
Scott, you want to read that? Sure. Uh, this is from Fire Department uh, Chief Steve Benjamin, Town of Sunderland's Board of Selectmen's Proclamation. Here we go with the whereas is. Whereas the Town of Sunderland, Mass., is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting Sunderland, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk from fire, and whereas home fires killed 2,735 people in the United States in killed in uh, 2016, according to the National Fire Protection Agency, sorry, Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 352,000 home fires, and whereas the majority of U.S. fire deaths, four out of five, occur at home each year, and whereas the fire death rate per 1,000 home fires reported to U.S. fire departments was 10 percent higher in 2016 than in 1980, and whereas Sunderland's residents should identify places in their home where fires can start and eliminate those hazards, and whereas Working smoke detectors cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half. And whereas Sunderland residents should install smoke alarms in every sleeping room outside each separate sleeping area and on every level of the home. And whereas Sunderland residents should listen for the sound of the smoke alarm and when it sounds respond by going outdoors immediately to the designated meeting place. And, we forgot the and, I got that one. And, whereas Sunderland residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And, whereas Sunderland first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And, whereas Sunderland residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take action to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2018 Fire Prevention Week theme, look, listen, learn, be aware, fire can happen anywhere, trademark, effectively serves to remind us that we need to take personal steps to increase our fire, our safety from fire. Therefore, we, the Board of Selectmen of the Sunderland, do hereby proclaim October 7th through 13th, 2018, as Fire Prevention Week throughout this city. And I urge all the people of Sunderland to be aware of their surroundings, look for available ways out in the event of fire, available ways out in the event of fire or other emergency. Respond when smoke alarm sounds by exiting the building immediately and to support the many public safety activities and efforts of Sunderland's Fire and Emergency Services during Fire Prevention Week 2018. No And there you have it. If the board would sign the proclamation, I'll put it up on oh, the website. We sign that, one. Okay. <clears throat> that one's in color. <laughs> motion to approve. Uh, motion. A lot of whereas is for a fire week deck. David second. Any other discussion? Um, Stephen, thank you for bringing forward um, this proclamation. And um, I, 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 I would hope that we have the opportunity to uh, ha maybe have uh, public education about fire safety mm -hmm. on, on our community access channel. And maybe uh, Chris can talk to the, the chiefs and uh, put something together. Um, a few years ago, they had a lot of, there was a, some, a lot of the Sunland um, Volunteer Fire Department had a mini, uh, they showed ice rescue and propane and, and a mm -hmm. lot of the training they do. But maybe reach out, Chris, if you could, and, and talk to Steve and, and uh, maybe simple things like even like testing a smoke alarm and such. Yeah. We're getting into the carbon monoxide season too. Mm. Right. Watch those vents, especially the direct vent. Yes. Keep them clear. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Three zero by signature. Okay. Next up, seven thirty one. Not too bad. It's like the, the, the David Pierce uh, maintained timepiece is a little off. He it put new batteries, so yeah. it run. It runs. It got new batteries. It runs a little fast. <laughs> okay. Seven thirty one. Um, we're going to talk about. Uh, Lucille and Dan Murphy are going to talk about North Main Street Reconstruction Project. 
Come on up forward, people, if you would, please. Pretty much everybody. Hi. <laughs> All right, so where do we stand now, Daniel? Where do we stand? Um, I guess we reached out to, uh, reached out to Michelle Denell at Complete Streets to try and get some guidance before we submitted the design exception report, trying to get some guidance as to whether or not um, a single direction shed use kind of the sidewalks in their present location mm -hmm. could serve to help meet some of the Complete Streets requirements for bicycles. So then the road would be able to maintain at about 26 feet uncurved. Uh, at least for the section between School Street and North Silver. Uh, and there it could widen and allow for a gateway to be constructed there because of the widening is actually, it actually creates space to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't really get it, we didn't get an answer that was uh, agreeable. Uh, she, basically she gave it to Kittleson. Kittleson, uh, I guess I'll say, didn't think five feet was the, I asked the question if there was any width. They didn't answer that, they just said the five feet didn't work and they raised a couple objections to it. And it's, that's okay, and good. I just want to add that in addition, so that's maintaining the sidewalks but having a shoulder for road bikes. Yes, for, yeah. The four the foot one, was it? Three, I think. Three? For yeah, ten, 10 for the travel lanes and three foot okay. shoulders without the curbs. Three foot shoulders without the curbs and retain the five foot sidewalks. I gotta say, reading the comments back, yeah. It kind of seemed like they didn't quite get their head around what we were proposing. Right. It's honestly. I don't know if we've had a chance to look at the response. In the correspondence. And in concurrently, we have been working on the narrative for, for the actual exceptions report, which has a lot more community stuff, uh, quotations from DOT documents that kind of support our perspective that the community character is important, I mean, other things like that. So that they really haven't seen. Right? Agreed. So obviously we haven't seen it, Rubito hasn't seen it, DOT hasn't seen it. Does, is it ready to submit with the engineer for exceptions? Pretty close. I mean, yeah, yeah we, we need to do some final edits. So we've all been through what we've made, you know, we weighed in, we just need a to finalize the document, but that can happen quickly. Yeah, we were hoping to get, we, really, we were holding up, hoping that we would get a, soon, a quicker answer yeah. from the Complete Streets Engineer, but uh, it took some time. And to be and to be clear, the Complete Streets Engineer kicked it out for a review. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was important. It was going to be a decision by a bureaucrat, but God forbid. So, I mean, it seemed like we had gotten kind of gotten the go ahead if those shoulders were five feet and the change from the last time was see if we could skinny down those mm -hmm. just so that the road didn't get to the full like 30, too wide. To 32 feet or 30 or 30. It's 30, 30 is what was the last yeah, 30. one that was out there. Okay. So, um, right, 10, 10, and 5, and 5. Right, 10, 10, 5, 5. And that, that's in keeping with what Lou Rubito wrote as well under option three. Right, mm -hmm. right. And it was also pretty clear, as I recall, in the correspondence from the folks at Complete Streets that either of the side path accommodations wouldn't work specifically for bicycles. They didn't talk about the cars. It seemed a little oblique, but they seemed to hang in on bicycles. It was hard to tell whether they were thinking that we were uh, thinking that the fast moving road bikes would now be on the five foot side forks, which is not what we're saying. What we're saying is let the, let the tricycles stay on the sidewalks where they've always been, create a shoulder, but, pre but not the full five foot shoulder mm -hmm. for the road bikes, right. so that we accomplish both the street calming to the extent possible and the uh, retaining the sidewalk, the sidewalks in the traditional location. Okay. It should be up to the bicyclists. Right. I think we know most of the hardcore bicyclists aren't going to be on the sidewalks. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. And the street. Yeah. Honestly, we've never really had a problem with the hardcore bicyclists right. being on the sidewalks. Or right. with anyone mowing someone down because they're moving right. too fast, on the, which is kind of the example they gave. Right. Right. Which is Not wide enough. I mean, they were actually, we were joking, but it turns out 
I, I don't know if the Franklin County can get one of these. You can get the uh, uh, counter. You you can get a ca you yep, can get yep. a pedestrian counter, mm -hmm. and you can also get a camera. Yep. Right. And you know I think we would see far more squirrels sure. on the sidewalk <laughs> than uh, fast moving bicyclists or slow moving bicyclists or pedestrians. I sure. mean, my dog barked at everything that went by in the street and it wasn't that many. It was annoying, but it wasn't that many. Well, the squirrels that don't make it across the road these days, I noticed. Yeah. I took the data from each camp and then scaled it back and I think I'd come up with 30 a day. Mm -hmm. All on the, on the so so what what yeah. do you what what now, I don't think we, we, we don't want to jeopardize two and a half million dollars from the from the state plus the two hundred and something thousand dollars that we've already spent on it. Um, we have to have a final decision pretty quick. Now, I, I thought at our last public hearing we had we had all agreed that the thirty foot was fine. I thought when the only reason was that Dan wasn't able to be here because his mom had died and it, this is a really a passionate issue for him and we felt it was unfair to have had a hearing where his voice really wasn't heard mm -hmm. um, and that you know and that was why we all got back together because for him the, the traffic calming issue is so key and those extra two feet on each side statistically I gather you know, will not accomplish the traffic calming issue. So um, that was why we thought, well, can we accomplish as a compromise something that's going to feel hopefully like it accommodates bicyclists, the road, and the pedestrians while maintaining our sidewalk goal and his traffic calming goal. And whether that's going to work, I don't know, but we thought it's worth a shot. And so that was really why we came back to see whether or not there would be some open-mindedness toward the three-foot uh, bike paths with the five-foot sidewalks, five-foot sidewalks being used for the timid bicyclists. Um, I think that actually the written argument is the same, whether those, whether that bike path, right. whether the bike shoulder is three or five feet. So. My inclination is to ask for the three feet, see if we can get it, and otherwise you resubmit it with five feet, and it's really you're making essentially the same argument except for the width of the, of the sidewalk. I mean, the, the community argument is the same, I think, no matter what. Right. So, the, I, I don't know. I mean, the only caveat I'd add is if, if we, I'm real big on the physical infrastructure being what calms the road. Mm -hmm. I don't want to rely on a flashing sign. Mm -hmm. I don't want to rely on a police chief or a police cruiser. So the physical infrastructure, so we've had this long discussion about matching north and south. And this curving, I mean, this 30 foot, it's wider on that end, but there's not on the other end. And right. I think the curving is actually, it is a physical limitation that you, you feel when you drive through it. So if we were to, if 30 feet is the final, has to be the answer, I would say, okay, but let's get curving through there and move the drains to the street, or at least partially. Mm -hmm. I'll still have some drains mm -hmm. within, within the island areas. I think that's what happened with South Main sometime in the past, because you can see some of the some of the grass areas are lower. So I'm sure it was country drainage through there at some point, and maybe the state paid for it years ago. Uh, some some at some time they some, something something changed, right? They changed. Okay, yeah, the town paid it. Well, Chapter Nine. Chapter I remember they, they did the whole green layout. And the right, and then it was all great. The state up, right? owned it and then gave it back to the town, looking back at some of the old plans. But anyway, if, if, if it was going to go thirty again, I. My strong argument would be make it the physical infrastructure that is the calming effect, and curbing is a, a big piece of that. And then if you have to have the five foot shoulders, at least have something on the outside. That, and then it matches. It also would match North Main Street, uh, South Main Street. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking for your process forward. I, I mean, right now we have, we have to submit something. Yep. Per personally, just, just personally, a, a 10 and 3, I think they told us that they won't accept. Mm -hmm. um, it's 10 and 3 to North Silver, mm -hmm. and then the 5, and then with the goal of getting, because really once you get past 
know, the celery and the clay brook. It ends quick. And then the next piece is you want to really get the falls. Right. If you want to have a wide shoulder, that's the place to have it, for right. sure. Right. So got like nothing up there. The case was right. to keep it calm in the center to North Silver, widen it, and then, I mean, I'd love to ask them to get all the way to Falls Road, but I don't think that's going to happen with part of this project, but it could be on okay. land on their radar to do it, you know, pronto, because you're going to have a five-foot trail that stops, right. you know, right at the, <clears> the, the yeah, clay work. I use the example at the end of Palmer Meadow Road in Southampton. It's exactly what I'm Say again, sir. I use the example of Palmer Meadow Road in Southampton, the intersection of College Highway and Palmer Meadow. That complete streets project ends and it just goes right to the white line that was there for 40 years. And you take right back off again. And frankly, it's a, it's a terrible termination. The road looks great. Yeah. Mm. Curbs look great. Shared path, eight feet. Sure. But it just ends. Bang. And it looks really goofy. Anyway, so get, yeah, I would say get your narrative to us so we can get it to the engineer to see if it passes the straight face test. I don't mean that as any kind of insult, but we got nothing to work with except opinions right now. Get us something in writing. So, so I, I would say we have to have everything. We have to have everything finalized and put together. You got to get it to the engineer. I appreciate what Dan and, and everybody's done to, to reach out to the Complete Streets folks and kind of say, okay, you know, this is a real project. To Lauren's point, if we didn't have that piece. Uh, that helps fine let's let's get that piece in place and put it under our engineers nose and say well this is the draft so we be ready by uh, next Wednesday yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. so have it submitted to us by next Wednesday so we can uh, pass it forward to the engineers okay excellent again I don't we, I, we don't have a problem because I mean our whole and Dan's been talking to us for a long time has always been about the calming of speed on the yep. things. So it's the same goal, but right now, we we just need to we just need to make it happen. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you. The only comment I have is I I, in, I I'm kind of in favor of the street the signs. I, guys, I think we really need to use a number of tools to calm the traffic. Yeah. And I go by those ones in North Hadley Village, and I. I especially since we've been talking about all this, I pay attention very closely to what vehicles do when they approach that. Sure, sure. And I think, and I because I agree with everything, I'm just wondering from a perspective, because I've read studies that say curbing actually increases speed. Like I've read some that have been the complete opposite, and especially like I've been reading a lot of like stuff that they've been doing in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they find that the more the edges are delineated, the more it actually increases speed. And from the studies they've done that, the more you have to look and figure out, well, where does it really end? It actually causes people to slow down a little more. Mm -hmm. So I think that's interesting. It's interesting. Like, I think we all got the same goal. It's just like you know, like the different ways to get there. Why don't you like the flashing sign? I, well, I, nah, I don't know. I guess I, I well, I'd want to knock on the door of the person. <laughs> well, well, that's that's that's, what about on the, that's one of my concerns. Where I live, what if we had one there coming into town? Flashing in the middle. Well, uh, there's there's a number of ones, and one of my concerns too is is because I saw them go up, and yeah. then not long after they went off for a while. So, and I, I hope it wasn't because of the way the road curves and stuff that whoever lives nearby is yeah. getting you know yellow light glaring in their room. Yeah. So that's one of my concerns is not having it do that. Like I think the one, the one they, yeah, we have one on 116, but there's no residential units right near it. Right. So that's a vastly different area. Point. The one that's in Northampton going in on Route 9 is a little nicer in that it's not quite as, you know, when you go by the cemetery and there's that sharp curve on the road, it's like right near there because the speed is 25, I think, going into there. There's one in South Deerfield. South Deerfield. Coming back uh, towards Sunderland uh, before the high school. That's right. I know because I've got. Is there? Before there was that sign, I got the blue. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think I just think like you know I wouldn't discount any of the tools like. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying I just but, I like the physical infrastructure rather than the size. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm not saying the signs don't have a place, and they may have a place. And I, I mean, the other thing that, I, you know, I'm seeing all these electric assist bikes out there and I, you know, I yeah. do recognize that we, you know, we may need to be prepared in these scooters and, you know, I mean, there right. may be more 
of this sort of interim speed traffic that we need to be thinking about too. So it's yeah, but what yeah. they have at UMass now was I mean, there, there's kids with <coughs> on skateboards, motorized skateboards. Oh yeah, yeah now. those things are right. terrifying. Yeah, I, I was, and I, I was amazed to see, watch them go up Clark Hill Road. It's like yeah, <laughs> how can a skateboard go uphill? But, yeah. yeah, and especially right the scooters because they're really starting to catch on in a lot of cities. And I've also been looking <coughs> at Peter. The usage of bikes too. Um, if you like to watch. Just to give a different opinion than, than Dan, is, as far as the signs, I think they're incredibly effective uh, when you see them, particularly combined with the actual speed limit at that moment. Mm. Um, it's very clear. I mean, I, and I've seen them in more and more places around the valley here. Yeah. And you know, my reaction is, yeah, people put them up to the work. Now, do they slow everybody down? No. no. There's always. Well, do they yeah. make a difference? Okay. And well, they, 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 really work, they work on on one sixteen because if you see the brake lights that go on, <laughs> right? Like, exactly. Come on on one sixteen. So then my question is. Everybody. Then my question is: This is a serious question. Mm. Why do we need to wait until this whole project is done to put to, up one to, of these? Well, I don't think we need to. Come into town on. Oh, on we can do it. North mm -hmm. Main Street. Do Why can't we do it now? We can. We do the trailers, right? Well, we have we have one. We do the, yeah. Why not? Why not the sign? To, to Peter's point. No, no, you can. Putting them up. They just put us. up. I mean, they they put up several in Montague in different places. You know, including very recently they've added another one I've seen. And you know, people aren't doing them because if they don't work, and everything I've seen says they work, so why are we waiting? Sure. You know, for completion of this project to do that. Don't we have a stretch along there where there's no house. Where we walk around the shrubbery? Yeah, there is. Like, uh, I think as long as we don't have to do it and move it and things like that, George, then uh, by all means. Ask, ask George what it would cost to put it on. You put it in the speed limit. The right. Just uh, south of like, the like the state, Like the state has them. Yeah. Before the house starts, so any flashing ain't going to go back. Okay. Right. That's fine. Cherry's going to ask George what it would cost. Yep. Okay, so it's clear what the thing is. And I just think, like, you know, I mean, it only works obviously going going south. Yeah. And my my sense is always that the problem was worse going south. Right, I think it is from what we've what seen. Right. Well, we get we'll, 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 we'll ask George. We'll ask George. We have an earmark. <laughs> well, well, we did twenty eight dollars. Yeah, you could probably do one on either um, side. That's four complete streets. Depends on. It's a little harder to find a place so, without. Yeah. Uh, I know we're not flashing right at right right somebody. Okay. That's why we'll, I think we'll the Northampton one's a little dimmer. We'll do that, but but I, I would uh, but before we install it or do that, we'd we'd have to get people in on whose house is near it because I do yeah, I do think some pe people would find it intrusive. Well, it's, it's I think Tom, if I could, you get the highway superintendent. You also got you know what is what does the, the the police department say about what point in the straight line of sight does it make sense to put it right? And if we get those two opinions, then buy the things and set them up. And maybe some of our traffic Easy. studies will help, like the right. the speed counts. All right, you can probably put a baffle around it too to shield the side light. So you need your stuff for next Wednesday yep. and yeah. to Sherry, okay? Yeah. Anything else, Peter? And, and I guess I just want to ask is this. What's been going on here with their latest efforts to uh, come up with a, uh, a narrower solution? Is that slowing down the overall project? If it gets rejected, yes. We have to, we have to move soon. Right. Because all I want to say is that road for bicyclists is a serious safety yep. issue. Oh, understood. Yep. Yeah. He said earlier, in terms of your duties as selectmen, Number one on the list is public health and safety. Mm -hmm. yep. Right, and and that's why we and more years that that goes. That's why it has you know the, there there is a there is a a final time and, and we have to have it and this unfortunately will be the last. I mean, we're all agreed on that, right? Yeah, I mean no, they'll yeah. make comments on the twenty-five, yeah. and then we'll go to the seventy-five, and then the right. comments will be right. incorporated right. in the yep. seventy-five. Right. That's, yep. that's the way it's going to go. Right? Okay. okay. And that's that's why I, I said if it, it passes, I'm sorry, if it, it fails, you know, it just adds a layer. The the work and the dialogue locally, that's not been an issue yet. But this is like the tenth hour of twelve. <laughs> it's time to submit something. Okay, so we'll have this stuff for uh, then. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, board of selectmen updates. Good, Mr. Chair. Scott. I was I was uh, late getting to this meeting because I was at the 
joint meeting with the Frontier Regional School Committee and the subcommittee that's worked on capital planning process and allocation. Uh, it was a single agenda meeting, uh, started at 5.30, and uh, I left as we were getting to the procedures and definitions part. But I'd like to, I'd like to thank the working group that worked hard on that, Joe McCarrion, as well as Darius Modesto. But I think the uh, Frontier Regional School Committee has a document and a decade-long plan that they could actually uh, work with. And the towns, uh, I hope, as there were members of each town select board on that body, can uh, convey the importance of a plan that identifies tools for capital needs and funding mechanisms that are directed toward capital needs, not just the ether of a, of, of a general appropriation. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue was solid, the plan's 29 pages long, and I hope the Frontier Regional School Committee um, continues to poke and poke and prod it like they should, like anything that's presented from a subcommittee, and, and adopt at least the best parts of it. So that's where I was tonight. Thank you, Scotty. Anything else? No. Davey? Um, no. We're going to be needing to schedule a personnel committee meeting pretty soon because we're starting to get some info in on that study. So Good. get rolling on that. What's that? Yeah, that's it. Uh, we met with uh, South County EMS um, last week. Uh, a couple things. Um, the, the dependability of our, the second ambulance. It was a Deerfield's original international chassis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the international appears not to be as dependable as what would one. Mm -hmm. The Ford chassis is, is been much better um, on ours. Mm -hmm. It used to be ours, now South County. And uh, history seems to serve that the uh, the Fords are doing better. Mm -hmm. A, can you have locally serviced mm -hmm. versus going to Nutmeg and, mm -hmm. Nutmeg and West Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so so they've been spending money on towing and, and maintenance has been I think seventeen thousand dollars was maintenance last year. Wow. Yeah. So yeah a time for a new one. Yeah. Well, it's not an old unit. It's no, I understand. A, but you I, but and, it's, and it wasn't. Well, it wasn't supposed to be up for replacement until next year. Mm -hmm. So that that's what we're talking about, and we discussed about uh, taking it, uh, separate the box and the chassis. So we're we're looking looking at that. Um, we talked about it, it's interesting. Um, we're doing more and more mutual aid to different places, mm -hmm. um, and and it's almost to the point where we may have to look at different or uh, a different manning schedule or or worker schedule. Mm -hmm. um, but that comes with questions about you know where some you know in in a town in a town that has paramedic level service, um, and in towns that don't have paramedic or, or some. There are some towns that don't have any service at all still. Um, so we, we're talking about the fundings for that. Also had a meeting with the South County Senior Center. Um, we had we hired a new director. Um, they've been and they've been going over the the, um, the budgets and stuff and it may be a little short on money according to her calculations. So that'll be uh, something that's going to be discussed in the next few few weeks, and when we have a town meeting, a special town meeting, they, they may put forward um, some class. corrections. Mm -hmm. um, so that that may happen. Um, I also like to to thank all the uh, members of the uh, of of the, Sun, the town of Sunderland that did a great job this past weekend with the uh, the car show the. Uh, the ghost uh, down the cemetery. The the I mean, it never ceases to amaze me how many people go go to the the ghost thing mm -hmm. and are so entertained by it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it was just it was um, a wonderful thing. And the art show, um, the level of uh, talent that that we're surrounded by every day, um, and you just don't and and sometimes you just don't have the opportunities. So I. I would like to thank the people that that headed up the um, 
the different committees that brought the, the participation to the town over this past weekend was outstanding. I'd just like to thank all of them because it was an outstanding. Um, it really, and again, it was labor of love for a lot of them. Right. So thank, I'd like to thank them. Um, and we have the, uh, the, the ball, the game of ball that's supposed to 103, 300 ball that's supposed to be in November. I heard there's still some tickets available. So if, you, if you're looking for tickets, you can uh, call the Sleckman's office and we can direct you to where the tickets can be purchased. But I would recommend it's going to be at the Blue Heron. It's going to be either Friday or Saturday night. So it, it'll be a, I think it's a Saturday night or a Sunday night. Sunday night. Right? One of those yeah. nights. A Sunday night. So it'll be um, it'll almost be a school night. Almost a school. Almost a school night. Um, there's going to be an outstanding band being that be playing that's scheduled to play. And it's again, it's a Sunderland resident that's donating his time. That's a, I think Emmy, mm -hmm. Grammy Award, Grammy, Grammy Award winning Sunderland resident. Um, so I just like to put a shout in to anybody that wants those tickets. There, there. I hear there's still a few tickets available. Town administrator updates. Um, last week we held the mandatory pre-bid meeting for the Sunderland Riverside Park project oh, nice. and uh, we had about 10 or 12 contractors attend that um, so we were happy with the turnout the bids are due on the 19th um, so we're moving along with that project uh, the complete streets project phase one <laughs> is just about uh, wrapping up um, we still have another piece where we're waiting um, for easement agreements from a couple of the uh, residents. Um, and then that'll also require town meeting action. Uh, so we'll probably, um, if all goes accordingly, construction for those will be in the spring. Um, and that's, that's about it. Um, Sherry, I just think that the complete streets, the, uh, the, the sidewalk improvements and, and such are up. And, and, and actually, people notice. Oh, they do. Yeah. They have. They're noticed. And, and um, the, the sidewalk from along 47 um, from Triple Oak Estates, uh, that's, I mean, you see people on it every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. So. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, good, good job. Okay. No. Anything else? Circuit up around Garage Road is something. Yeah, yeah. Garage Road, road too. Big improvement. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right, anything else? Um, front un Frontier Union 38 contract negotiation representative. I've done it for the last three or four years, four or five years, sorry. Four or five cycles. Cycles. Cycles, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so People lose cycles back, that's a and, triennial and, and, event. <laughs> and I, I have said that I'm, I'm willing to uh, step aside on that if somebody wants to take, a, take another shot at it. Um, David Scott, thoughts? I've, I've worked at the regional level with a tech school, and if, if you're not inclined, then I could put my name in the hat to work with uh, Frontier this time. I've also worked with Union 38 in the past, so. Okay. Um, Sherry, could you uh, put, mm -hmm. unless David, you want to do it? It doesn't, I'll, either way, that's fine with me, so. Okay. So could you put Scott's name in there? Okay. David's probably going to meet up, I mean, go on the uh, the, the local school committee. The Union 38 one? Yeah, yeah you like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so put, put Scott's name. For the uh, front here? Yeah, if, if you could just put Scott's name in there. Okay. Okay, anything else? Are we all set then? That's it. Uh, uh, registration to vote, is it this Friday? Very Please. soon. Yeah. Pay attention to the dates. If it's oh, not for early voting? Time, check the website. Registration for the okay. election coming okay. up. So. All right. Anything else? Then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion. Second. We have a motion made and second to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. We are out at 8.01.